All right, everybody, good afternoon. I have uh, I think one thing for you at the top, and then we'll get started. So before we get started, I wanted to preview what to expect tomorrow night with uh, President Biden delivers his third State of the Union. You will hear the president lay out the historic achievements he has delivered on, on for the American people and his vision for the future. Looking at what President Biden faced when he came into office and where we are now, it is clear he's gotten more done in the first three years than most presidents have accomplished in two terms. He will talk about the success in implementing his agenda from infrastructure to chips to lowering drug prices and getting rid of junk fees, as you heard him speak to yesterday with his competition council. He will talk about whose side he is on and his plan to improve the lives of all Americans. That includes lowering costs for Americans and giving people more breathing room, lowering health care premiums and taking on Big Pharma to lower the cost of prescription drugs making the wealthy and corporations pay their fair share in taxes, saving our democracy and protecting our democratic institutions, protecting women's reproductive health in the face of relentless attacks from Republican elected officials, making progress on his unity agenda, ending cancer as we know it, delivering on the sacred obligation to veterans, tackling the mental health crisis and beating the opioid and overdose pandemic. We will have more to share tomorrow, but uh, fundamentally, the president will outline an agenda that is about continuing to build on the progress that we've made over the last three years. The president has always been an optimistic person, as you all know, and even in the face of challenges that we have in front of us, he will share why he is hopeful about this country's future and why it is a mistake. It is a mistake to bet against the American people. With that, Sung Ming. Um, I have a couple on uh, Haiti, if I may. Sure. Um, so earlier today, Ambassador Linda Thomas Greenfield said that the U.S. has asked the Prime Minister to quote move forward in a political process that will lead to the establishment of a presidential transitional council that will lead to elections. So I just want to clarify: Does that mean a resignation? Did the U.S. government ask him to resign directly? So a couple of things: We are not. We are definitely not pushing. Prime, the Prime Minister to resign. That is not what we're doing, but we have underscored that now is the time to finalize a political accord to help set Haiti on a path to a better future. And that is something that we've been working on for some time. Uh, we've been working that on that with the CARICOM, so that is nothing new. We've had those conversations, and also the Haitian partners on the path to restoring democratic order in Haiti through free and fair elections, inclusive governance, and power sharing. This will give the people uh, the op an opportunity to democratically elect their prime minister. Again, this has been a conversation that we've had with Haitian partners, CARICOM, with some for some time now, so that is not new, and we certainly are not pushing him to resign. Um, even even though you're not directly calling on him to resign, um, can you just discuss the timing of why you're encouraging of this transitional government now, and also because um, obviously the White House has long resisted specifically pushing for his resignation, even if you aren't doing it now. So can you just talk about the timing of this encouragement of what, why you're doing everything the way you are? Sure, right again, we're not pushing, as you just stated in your question, uh, for the Prime Minister to resign. This has been a long time conversation that we have had with our Haitian partners, with CARICOM, on making sure that there was a path to restoring democratic order. Uh, so that has been consistent with what we've been trying to do for some time now. And we believe, uh, you know, it is uh, the Haitian people they need to have an op opportunity to democratically elect their prime minister. And so there needs to be uh, a plan in place, to obviously, to do that. And so that's what we're encouraging. But we've been having these conversations for some time now. And one domestic matter, um, back in uh, February of 2021, President Biden said Donald Trump should not be given the traditional intelligence briefings that were given to former presidents because, quote, what value is giving him an intelligence briefing? What impact does he have at all, other than the fact that he might slip and say something? Does the president still feel that way now, now that Donald Trump is on the way to becoming the party's, the Republican Party's nominee and would be entitled to the briefings that a, president, a party candidate would get? I think the president's words stand today, as he stated them a 
however long ago. I don't think his mind has changed on that. I just don't have anything to add. Do you do anything to block him from getting these briefings later I, this year? I don't have anything to add, but the president was very clear about how he felt about that, and I would say those, those comments certainly do stand today. Thanks, Karine. Can you confirm that the White House invited the Ukraine's First Lady to the State of the Union, but that she declined to attend? So the White House did invite Mrs. Zelenska uh, to the State of the Union. She was unable to attend. I would refer you to uh, Ukraine as to her reasoning why, but she did indeed uh, uh, she did indeed receive an inv invitation from us. And there was also an invite that went out to Navalny's wife. Can you talk a bit about how the president may address foreign policy issues? Of course, he's going to be speaking to Republicans, many of them who you know he wants to convince to back more funding to Ukraine. So, look, I'm going to be really mindful and not get ahead of the president uh, on his State of the Union uh, remarks, so not going to lay that out and how he's going to address uh, Republicans, as you mentioned, who will be in front of him. Uh, but, you know, the president, as it relates to certainly Ukraine, the president's going to continue to make his case that uh, House Republicans need to move forward. The speaker needs to put the national security supplemental on the, on the floor. We know that it would get overwhelming support. And and also, it's also about our, our national security, our own national security. And so we can't let politics get in the way of our national security. So the president's going to make that clear, and I'll just leave it to uh, uh, the president. As he would say, stay tuned. Stay tuned for tomorrow. Just be clear, he'd make that, those points clear at the State of the Union. He's going to continue to make that case clear. You asked me how he's going to uh, do that or, or lay that out tomorrow in the State of the Union. I just don't want to get into get ahead of the president. But our message continues, right, as it relates to national security supplemental. Obviously, the Ukraine aid is included in that supplement. And Justice Navalny also invited and couldn't attend. Uh, so. So I, I talked about this yesterday. Mrs. Mrs. Navalny was indeed invited personally by the president. She was not able to attend. I would refer you, uh, obviously, to her uh, to to explain why. But yes, she was Just invited. Just lastly, on the yes. Russian missile strike, it hit. It was only about 200 feet away from President Zelensky. That's according to one of our sources. And a source close to Zelensky tells us that they believe Zelensky was the intended target. Is the U.S. looking into that strike? Do they believe that Zelensky was, in fact, the intended target? So I can't speak to what they were targeting. Uh, that's not something that I can speak to. But it appears uh, that it landed near, as you just said, the convoy. And I think Russia's actions speak for themselves here. But I just can't. I can't speak for their their exact target. Karine, do you have any reaction to the sailors that were reportedly killed in the Houthi attack? So let me say a couple things about that. Um, that happened earlier today. So today, the Houthis have killed innocent civilians by continuing their reckless attacks against international commercial shipping, which impacts countries throughout the world. The ship they attacked was a Barbados-flagged Liberian-owned bulk carrier. It was not a U.S. ship, contrary to what the Houthis claimed. These reckless attacks by the Iran-backed Houthis have not only disrupted global trade and commerce, but also taken the lives of international sea, uh, seafarers simply doing their jobs. We offer our condolences, obviously, to the families of those who lost their lives and, again, condemn the Houthis for these attacks. And we will call on governments around the world to do the same and join us in bringing to a halt these appalling attacks. Thanks. And, and then uh, one more on Haiti. We understand that the Prime Minister Henri is uh, located in the United States right now in Puerto Rico. Could you talk a little bit about what his status is there and what the United States is, is doing as far as his travel logistics? So I cannot speak to the, the Prime Minister's travel. He would have to speak to it himself. I just cannot speak to that. Okay, and then should we expect any uh, policy, like detailed policy uh, rollout associated with the State of the Union tomorrow? I don't have anything to share at this time. The President, I'm not going to get ahead of the President, certainly, as he would say, stay tuned, stay tuned. Okay. Hey, Karine, um, did the President have any reaction to Dean Phillips suspending his presidential campaign? I don't have any reaction. Uh, I would have to refer you to the campaign. Um, can you tell us generally whether you know if the President thinks there's you know, legitimacy behind some of the main reasons that Phillips decided to run for president, concerns about the president's age, concerns that he is a vulnerable general election candidate. Is that something you've ever spoke, spoken to him about? So I'm going to be really careful. We're talking about an upcoming election and uh, obviously in, in, in November, so going to be really mindful. Look, uh, this is why I think the State of the Union is going to be really important. 
Uh, the president's going to lay out what he has done the last three years, the successes that he's had, historic uh, successes that he's had. He's going to speak to how he sees the future, the future for uh, for this country on behalf of the American people. And I think that's going to be important. And I would say this um, as it relates to part of your question. Look, the president has been very clear. He's been very honest about his age. He knows that. He makes jokes about it, right? He, he makes jokes about his friend Jim, Jimmy Madison, right? He gets that. But this is also a president that has gotten done more in the last three years than most presidents have in their two terms of presidency. And that is what we've seen from the data. And a lot of that is because of his experience. His experience matter. His experience is 36 years as a senator, eight years as vice president, and now into his, into his first term as president. It has shown that he can get things done. We see that with the economy. We see that what he's trying to do with lowering costs. We see what he's trying to do with health, lowering health care costs. And a lot of historic uh, pieces of legislation that was done, that are now law, obviously, that was done in a bipartisan way. And that's because of the president's experience. And I think that matters. Uh, and I'm just going to let the president speak more to his future, his vision, what he sees uh, for this country uh, tomorrow night. And just a quick question on um, State of the Union. You know, there was obviously a universe where a a ceasefire and hostages deal was reached before the State of the Union. It seems increasingly clear that that's not going to happen in the next 36 hours. So given that, can you give us a little bit of insight into how the president has been working to draft a speech that addresses and speaks to just the anger and frustration that a lot of people are feeling about the fact that he is not willing so far to call for a permanent ceasefire? So look, as you've heard the president call for a, cease, a ceasefire, a period of time, a pause where there's a period of time where obviously the fighting stops, right? And with that is a hostage deal where we can get these hostages back home to their family and their loved ones. And let's not forget, the hostages include about six Americans. And so that's incredibly important. At the same time, let's not forget getting that all important humanitarian aid into Gaza to the Palestinian people. And so that is important. Uh, that is a first step that we need to get to. The president's going to continue to continue to work on this as he has been for the past several weeks, for the past several months, along with his team. So we are steadfast, focused on that. Uh, that is not going to change just because there's a State of the Union tomorrow. Uh, and so so the president is going to be optimistic. He is. Uh, as it relates to his speech, look, these speeches, uh, all of them, you know, they, they, they take massive undertaking, right? They take a lot of work and to actually meet the moment of where we are as a country and also lay out the future for this country. So not going to get into specifics as to how he's working through that. You'll hear it from him directly. Uh, but the president certainly is going to meet the moment where we are as a country, uh, lay out his the progress that that we've seen in the last three years, and not just that, how do we build on, the, on that progress? Do you happen to know what about the speech writing process this time around the president has found most challenging? Um, look, this is his third State of the Union address, as you know. Uh, this is uh, uh, going to be, as, as you can imagine, a very important, uh, uh, important as he sees it, a conversation uh, that he'll have with the American people. Mil millions of people are going to be watching. Uh, and so it's not just about the people who are uh, the elected officials who are in front of him. And so, you know, I would say this. I would say this is certainly a continuation of those conversations that he has with, Ameri with the American people when he goes out, uh, when he goes out uh, and travels on the road, right? He hears directly from them. He hears what they are dealing with. He, heals, he deals with what their family is dealing with. And so it's built on that. It's built on those conversations, though, that experience that he has, and knowing and having his finger on the pulse, of certainly, about what the American people have been going through these past three years. Uh, going to be, again, going to be really mindful, not going to dive into his thought process. I think uh, when he delivers his speech tomorrow night, you'll get a good sense of where the president is and how he sees where we are at this country, the state of the union, obviously, hence uh, the opportunity that he has tomorrow. And so I will just leave it at that. Gotcha. Yeah, thanks. Uh, after uh, Nikki Haley withdrew this morning from the Republican presidential primary, President Biden uh, issued a statement and a direct appeal to her voters. Does President Biden plan to reach out uh, to Nikki Haley at some point, and has he yet, or has he yet? That's for the campaign to speak to. I don't have anything on that for you.
Yeah. Um, yesterday, I believe, uh, Jake Sullivan uh, announced that the administration backs a bipartisan bill that would uh, lead to the banning of TikTok. Um, does, does that, does, does Jake's views represent the views of the rest of the White House? So just a couple of things, and I'll get to uh, your comment about the banning, but I do want to say a couple of things at the top. The administration has worked uh, with members of Congress from both parties to pursue a durable legislative solution that would address the threat posed by certain technology services operating in the United States that put at risk Americans' personal information and broader national security. And so what we see is this bill is important. We welcome uh, this step on ongoing efforts to deal with that, to address that, uh, and we appreciate the bipartisan work. I think that's important that this was done in a bipartisan way, and so we look forward to working with Congress. Obviously, we provided technical assistance, as we normally do when uh, pieces of legislation are, are like this are being put together. But I would have to say, you know, um, we don't see this as banning these apps. That's not what this is. Uh, but by ensuring that their ownership isn't in the hands of those who may do us our harm. This is about our national security, obviously, and this is what we're focused on here. Um, and the president would sign a bill. Though. I mean, the bill explicitly gives the administration the authority to ban the apps if those ownership questions aren't resolved, and the president would sign it, right? So we welcome the bill. We obviously are working with them, uh, and Jake's, we think... Jake's words were to quickly act, urging Congress to quick, act quickly to yeah. send it to the president's and that's, desk. And that's what I was going to say. We welcome it. Obviously, we've been working with them on it, and we would want to see this bill get done so it can get to the president's okay, desk. Final question. Is the president planning on talking to TikTok influencers on Friday after the State of the Union about his speech? Uh, I, that's a good question. I don't have anything for you on that, on his uh, schedule for tomorrow. Once we do, we certainly will share that. For Friday. Right? For Friday, pardon me, for Friday. As you know, he's going to be on the road on Friday. I don't have And anything. if he does, you wouldn't see any contradiction between the fact that the president would be using a, a technology so that he's I, urging Congress I mean, to... Here's the thing, and, and I've been asked this question multiple times about TikTok and our, our use of TikTok. As it relates to the campaign, I know camp the campaign has created a TikTok uh, account. I would let them speak to that. That is their strategy. I would let them speak to that. And we've said this before. We are going to try to meet the American people where they are. We are. I mean, we're trying to reach everyone. The president is, Amer is, a, is, a, is a president for all Americans. And so that's what we're trying to do there. Even, doesn't, if, even if it's a dangerous platform. But it, does, it doesn't mean that we're not uh, going to try to figure out how to protect our national security, right? That's what we're doing here. That's what you see in this bipartisan uh, uh, legislation that's being moved forward that you heard from Jake about, that, you heard, that you're hearing from me about. It doesn't mean that we don't do the work to make sure that we protect Americans. And that's what we're going to do here. Got time. Thanks, Shereen. Um, my colleague reported that U.S. officials told members of Congress in a recent classified briefing that the U.S. has quietly approved and delivered more than 100 um, separate foreign military cells to Israel since the Gaza war began on October 7th. I'm wondering if the administration um, has uh, has any comment on, on just the, the scale of, of the amount of, uh, or the White House has any comment on the scale of the amount uh, that's been I'm transferred. I'm just not going to comment on that. White House thinks that there should be more transparency around. I'm, I'm just not, I'm not going to comment on a reporting and what you've heard. I'm just not going to comment on that. Okay, Jordan. Thanks, Green. Uh, just one more a point of clarification on the TikTok stance. Uh, are you saying that President Biden would sign the bill in its current form? Because the NSC statement said that you want to work with members of Congress mm -hmm. to put on stronger legal footing. So it sounds like yeah. he would not sign it in its current form. We need it to be worked on, right? We, as we have stated, we welcome the, we welcome the steps that they've taken. Obviously, it still needs some work. Obviously, we're providing technical support. And once it gets to a place where we think, to your point, it's on legal standing and it's in a place where it can uh, get out of the Congress, then the president would sign it. But it needs, we need to continue to work on it, obviously. One more on the Houthi attack. Um, can you say if the U.S. is readjusting its military strategy against Houthis in response to this deadly incident, is the U.S. going to step up uh, attacks on Houthi positions in Yemen in response? So look, uh, the U.S. obviously is going to continue to take action. 
Uh, and we believe that, and I'm not going to get into national security here, we believe that we have seen, uh, we have been able to degrade uh, their capabilities in the actions that we've taken over the past several weeks, several months. Uh, and so that's, that's been very clear in our assessment. Uh, but this is not just our problem. Obviously, this is an international one. So uh, we are working in a multi, multinational coalition uh, to deal with what we're seeing uh, currently by the Houthis. And so, look, uh, this is something that we're going to continue to do. Uh, we're going to continue to take action. Uh, and that's what you have seen uh, this administration do over the past several weeks. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> continuing on the Houthis, yeah. why is the U.S. Navy having so little uh, effect on stopping these kinds of attacks from happening? So as I was answering the question uh, to Jordan a second ago, uh, I'm not going to get into specific intelligence here, but broadly speaking, broadly, uh, we know that the strikes have indeed impacted on degrading their capabilities, and that's important. Uh, we have taken out significant amount of Houthi weapons, and our military is regularly destroying Houthi missiles, and, and when they're being loaded and prepared to launch, but before they can actually be fired, at commercial ships. So that's what we've been able to do. So we will continue to act as needed to degrade the Houthis' capabilities. And this is a process. This is a process here. Does the U.S. Uh, still hold Iran responsible for these attacks? It's, it hasn't changed. Our, our stance on that has not changed. And what would happen if the Houthis hit a U.S. naval ship? You've seen us, you've seen us respond uh, when you saw three uh, military members um, were killed not too long ago, you saw our response. So we are, the president is also the commander in chief, as you know, and he, he understands that, that responsibility. And just to button up one thing on Haiti about yeah. the prime minister being in Puerto Rico, just to re clarify, yeah. he's there on his own volition or is the United States providing aid and comfort? So we are, we are not providing any assistance uh, to help the prime minister certainly return to Haiti. We're not uh, going to speak to his travel. That is something for him to speak to. As far as you know, he's just enjoying the sights. Uh, that's for him. <laughs> that's one way to put it. Uh, that's for him to speak to. All right. <laughs> is the president preparing for hecklers during the State of the Union? Look, um, you saw the president last year. Uh, uh, when uh, when some uh, Republican members uh, behaved in a way that was, uh, I would say, disrespectful, and he handled that, and that he did that on his own, and he held them to account as it related to important programs that matter to the American people, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, he called them out on it as they were obviously heckling at him. And so uh, the president's ready for anything. He's ready for anything, as you saw him literally do that last, last year. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was something to watch. You all during, reported on that. During speech preparations, is he <laughs> prepping for that drilling? Uh, look, the president, I mean, the president knows how to, how to handle this stuff. I mean, again, he did it literally last February of 2023. And nobody was expecting that. Nobody was expecting that. And he took them on and laid out and fought for the American people on programs that matter to them. And so, uh, he, you know, he got this. The president's that, got this. Given that House Speaker Mike Johnson has invited and is hosting the parents of Evan Gershkovich, um, what is the White House's reaction to that, given his role in stalling the national security bill, do you think? What does the White House think about his invitation to uh, Gershkovich's parents? as it relates to the national security supplemental and the speaker yeah. refusing to put it on the floor so that it can get overwhelming support yeah, yeah, as we know it's going to get and it was it, it will work towards our national security right it will protect the american people national security that's how we feel the speaker should actually put the bill on the floor that we know republicans are going to vote for it obviously democrats are going to vote for it overwhelming support if he cares about our national security and put politics aside, he should do that. I, I ask because the White House has said before that the Speaker, by stalling the national security bill, he's giving aid to Russia, and now he's invited. I mean, that's, that still stands. I mean, you know, I was just asked by one of your colleagues about uh, the convoy, right, where, uh, where President Zelensky was and the attack that happened near his convoy. We know what Russia is up to. We've seen what has been happening on the, bat on the battlefield over the past several weeks because of Congress's inaction. And so we've been really clear. When the, the, four, the big four were here just last week, the CIA director was in the room, and he laid out the dire consequences for Ukraine 
look, we have to stand up for, just like the, Ukra the brave Ukrainians are standing up for democracy, we have to do the same. It also speaks to our own national security. So the speaker needs to put that national security supplemental on the floor and let it get that overwhelming support, bipartisan support that we know that it's going to get. And finally, just to button some, something up on Haiti, mm -hmm. yesterday Admiral Kirby said that it was a simplistic explanation that there was um, you know, money being held up um, when it comes to this multinational security force, that Republicans were holding up some of this money. He said that there are other reasons for it. But I'll ask the question more bluntly. Do you blame Republicans for holding up critical money for Haiti? So let's not forget what we're providing uh, to Haiti is emergency, uh, really important uh, emergency needs, right? When we think about food, health care, clean water, and other forms of critical assistance through UN and uh, NGO partners to help people in need across Haiti. And so what we are seeing and what everyone is actually realizing is that the deteriorating situation in Haiti has required organizations to adjust uh, their posture and at times prevented uh, aid from reaching people in need. And that is just because of what we're seeing, obviously, on the ground. Uh, and so we're going to, humanitarian partners are going to continue to provide uh, the assistance amidst the uh, current security uh, breakdown, obviously. Uh, the best way that they can. But as we know, there is a dire situation on the ground. It has made it very difficult uh, to get that aid. Uh, and, and we have said this before, the U.S. government has, le has been leading uh, in providing aid to the Haitian people. Um, on the State of the Union tomorrow, how much of it can we um, expect to be forward-looking, uh, potentially presenting a, a vision for the a second term um, versus going over kind of the accomplishments of the, the first term? So I don't have a formula to read out to you right now. What I can say is he's going to take a look back, as I, st I said at the top look at the achievements and the successes that we have had the last three years and also speak to how we're going to continue to build on those successes and fight for the CHIPS Act, fight for the infrastructure, in, 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 sorry, uh, uh, Inflation Reduction Act, which is, as we know, at least as it relates to the Inflation Reduction Act, Republicans have tried to claw back. And these are important pieces of legislation that we need to continue to implement and protect. So you're going to hear him talk about that. I've talked about uh, other, other things that the President wants to focus on uh, lowering costs, fighting for our democracy, fighting for reproductive rights. So he's going to talk about that, talk about the future, talk about his vision for the American people. He's an optimistic guy, as we know, but I don't have a formulation on percentages or how, how, how that's going to be divvied up, but that's what you can expect to hear from the president. And is the administration still debating taking executive action on, uh, on immigration? I mean, we've been clear about this. Uh, the, the bottom line is the best way to have moved forward on dealing with immigration, dealing with the border challenges that we're seeing, was for Republicans to have gotten out of the way, not let the former president tell them what to do, and actually move forward with a bipartisan proposal that came out of the Senate. That would have been the toughest, the fairest way to have moved forward with dealing with our immigration. As it relates to, um, as it relates to an executive action, that we believe that's the best way to do that. No executive action would have been able to have the impact that bipartisan proposal would have had. We're always going to look at and evaluate everything, but we just have not made a decision on that. Is there a timeline for when that decision will be made? Uh, don't have a timeline for you. Again, the best way to move forward to deal with this broken immigration system that has been broken for decades, the best way to move forward with the challenges at the border is to get this bipartisan uh, bipartisan proposal moved forward. Go ahead, Nadia. Thank you, Karine. Um, since you don't have a comment on the Washington Post story, I hope you have an answer for my question. Um, a group of um, House Democrats sent a letter to the president saying basically that an, an Israeli invasion of Rafah will be in violation of U.S. law and international law when it comes to we weapon sales to Israel. So um, do you think that Israel has been abiding by the U.S. law, despite the fact that 70 percent of the people being killed are women and children? So I've, I've, I've heard about the reporting of the letter, so I don't want to, I haven't seen the letter, so I can't speak, speak specifically to it. No, 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 let me, but I'll, I'll give you an answer that I think uh, will uh, address your question. Um, 
So, look, as you all know, our support, uh, we have supported Israel as they defend themselves against Hamas, a terrorist organization. As you know, that has been uh, the policy here. We also continue to urge Israel uh, to do everything possible to avoid civilian casualties. And even as Hamas has embedded, let's not forget, they've embedded, and I know you know this uh, itself among civilian population, that is something that they have done. As we have said, uh, there have been far too many civilians who have been killed in this conflict, it's far too many. And the president understands that, the vice president understands that, this entire administration understands that. And, and there's not enough humanitarian aid getting in. We need to increase humanitarian aid. And you've heard that again from the president, you've heard that from the vice president. And so that's why we're working so hard to get that hostage deal. As we know, that would lead to a ceasefire where the fighting would stop. We can get those hostages home to their families. We can get that all needed humanitarian aid to the, the, people, of, uh, uh, the people in Gaza, which need it obviously need that uh, critical aid. And we're continuing to do what we can, right? The air, the uh, airdrops that were successful, we announced that yesterday. There's more coming uh, from the Department of Defense. You've, the USAID is in the, in the region providing humanitarian aid. We're working with our regional partners to get more humanitarian aid in. And so we have to up, cre uh, up that, uh, obviously, the humanitarian aid, but this deal is so important. We have to get this deal so we can we can get more aid in. But not just that. Put a put a pause. Put a have a ceasefire in place so that we can actually move forward here. Can I have a question for a colleague. Will the president meet with the prime minister of Sweden tomorrow? He's on his way here. Will he be a guest at the State of the Union? And will the president? I know you don't want to yeah. uh, speak ahead of the speech, but will he talk about Ukraine and the success of the administration bringing? Finland and Sweden into NATO. So, going to be really mindful. You know, I'm not going to speak to the president's uh, uh, speech here in detail. Um, uh, and so, going to be really mindful. I don't have anything to read out on the meeting um, there uh, with the president. I believe this, the Secretary of State is having a meeting uh, with the Sweden Prime Minister. So, obviously, you can you can uh, reach out to them. Just don't have anything else to share beyond that. Get Danny. Thanks, Karine. Um, on Haiti, um, given the dire situation there, is there any consideration of sending U.S. forces uh, in any way to stabilize uh, things there? No. No. As you know, there is the uh, the uh, Kenyan has agreed uh, to send about 2,000 forces there. Uh, so that was recently signed, and that's going to move forward. But there is no uh, no plan to bring uh, U.S. forces into Haiti. Okay. Uh, also in Haiti, um, uh, earlier you said that the administration is not pushing Henry to resign. Are you denying that yesterday uh, the administration asked Henry to stand aside for a, traditional, uh, a transitional government and an interim prime minister? What I can say is we're not pushing the prime minister to resign. We're just not. Now, have we been working with CARICOM? Have we been working with our Haitian partners to put forth uh, a, you know, a plan? To, to figure out how do we uh, move forward in restoring uh, restoring democratic order in Haiti through free and fair elections. That is a conversation that we have had, but we are not pushing the prime minister out but to resign. Asked him to stand aside. We are not pushing. I think I just answered that question. We are not pushing him to resign. Okay. Thank you, Corrine. <laughs> <laughs> New topic. Uh, I wonder what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, has President Biden called to congratulate Jason Palmer? <laughs> uh, we uh, congratulate Jason Palmer on his win last night. Okay. Uh, now that the field is down to two, is President Biden going to commit to a debate with Donald Trump? That's something for uh, the campaign to speak to. Well, we know when the debates are going to be. We know oh, where they're going to be. Is he going to go? You should speak to the campaign. In 2020, once it got down to one-on-one, -on -one, Joe Biden said, I can hardly wait to debate him. How about now? I'm going to sound like a broken record. You should reach out to the campaign. Why is this a campaign thing? Because it's an election. It's a debate for the 2024 presidential election. I'm not asking what argument he is going to make no. at a debate. I'm just at uh, it's, okay, not an, that, it's not an argument. We're not talking you, about arguments. You're talking about his attendance. You, you need to talk to the campaign. You get a lot of questions here about these polls concerning the president's age and his acuity. Do you think that it is going to quiet concerns about the president's age and acuity if he decides not to debate? What I can say about that is 
not talking about the debate. That's something for the campaign to speak to. I'm not going to speak about that. To your, to your question about age, I think I sort of answered that. I mean, you know, you're going to see the State of the Union tomorrow. You're going to hear the president lay out his plans. Uh, you're going to hear the president, a president who has had a successful three years of progress. Uh, still a lot more work to be done, but a progress nonetheless in how he's going to build on that. Bless you. <laughs> did you was, did you say something while you were no, okay. Um <laughs> Some fun here on Wednesday afternoon. But he he wouldn't have been able to get it's all seriousness. You know, you saw the you saw the graphics behind me. You saw what the president has been able to do: fourteen point eight million jobs, unemployment under four percent, continuing to find ways to lower costs. We saw that when he made the announcement on junk fees. You saw what he's been able uh, to do for the American people internationally as well, protecting our national security, being a leader as we're trying to fight a dictator, as Ukraine is fighting a dictator, uh, that is Mr. Putin. And this is because of the president's leadership. It really is. I mean, 36 years in the Senate, eight years as vice president, that counts for something. That counts for experience. That counts for having these relationships. That counts for knowing how to get things done. And the president wants to build on that. He does. And not only that, when people were saying he couldn't get things done in a bipartisan way, he was able to do that. Infrastructure, it was a punchline in the last administration. It was a joke. Now we actually have an infrastructure decade. You think about what we've been able to do for our veterans in the PACT Act, really help our veterans. You think about the Chips and Science Act, which is bringing home manufacturing. 800,000 jobs have been created. This is what the president's been able to do. And guess what? That's because of his experience. And so just for clarity, it's possible that there will be no Joe Biden, Donald Trump debates. Is this that what fall. you is that is that what you're excited about? Is that what you want to see? I would because love you keep to asking see Joe me, you've asked me about Trump three, debate. four, five different times in different ways. And I have do, and I've how said President Biden do in a debate. I'm not asking a question about a specific debate. I'm can just I, asking how okay. will he do in a can debate? I, I know it's been something? four years since you he saw You literally it. saw just last year, back in January 2023, at the last State of the Union, take on Republicans during giving a major speech. He took them on. As they were heckling him, he took them on and said he was going to fight for programs, essentially said he was fighting for programs that the American people needed. Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. He stood there and fought for the American people. I mean, that was pretty impressive. Some of you all reported on that. OK, I'm going to keep going. Go ahead, Phil, in the back. Thank you. Uh, Victoria Newland, the third, third highest ranking US diplomat uh, who's had a hand in the future of Ukraine for some time, announced that she plans to step down. How did the president <coughs> react to news of that resignation? And does he believe um, you know, that she was successful during her tenure there? So uh, I have not spoken to the president about this, so I can't give you an answer directly from the president. Um, um, and so I'm just going to leave that there. Uh, obviously, it's an important position. We, um, uh, we uh, appreciate her service. It is not easy to serve, as you know, and we appreciate her service. I just don't want to get into any specifics on that. I don't have anything to share. Question, then. Um, what's the president's reaction to France codifying abortion rights in their constitution? So we appreciate uh, countries uh, taking a step forward uh, to protect uh, the right for a woman, a woman, a woman to make a very difficult decisions uh, on their health care. We appreciate that. I think that's a good thing to see. Uh, and as it relates to here in this country, the president's going to talk about uh, reproductive rights and fighting for that. And what we're seeing across the country, more than 300 bills that were introduced recently on finding ways uh, to prevent women from making these really important decisions on their bodies. And that should not be. And that's because Roe v. Wade uh, was overturned, which is a law, a, a law that was constitution for, that was part of the constitution for almost 50 years, almost 50 years. And that was taken away. We see Republicans putting forth uh, three national, uh, national bans against abortion. That's, you know, that's not, that's not what the president's fighting for. He's fighting for 
the right for a woman to make a decision on their on her on her own body. And does he think that the French prohibition on abortion after 14 weeks is reasonable? Uh, look, I'm not going to get into the specifics of that particular uh, bill. What I could say it's 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 always important to see other other countries actually take steps to protecting uh, protecting rights, uh, fundamental rights that women should have. But I'm not going to get into the specifics of the bill. Go ahead, Karen. Ms. Green, can you give us some insight into the president's uh, State of the Union prep sessions at Camp David? Who was he working with on the speech, and what does he do? I mean, is he writing lines or is he editing what's given to him? What's that process like for him? So, look. Um, you know, uh, as it relates to Camp David, obviously the, Camp the president was at Camp David over the weekend. He worked on his speech, on the State of the Union speech with his senior staff, uh, which included Bruce Reed, uh, Anita Dunn, Steve Reschetti, and Vinay, uh, Vinay Reddy. Uh, this is fairly standard. He was there last year for the February uh, State of the Union. And I think, you know, even throughout today and tomorrow, he's going to continue to fine tune uh, the speech. This is something that he is personally involved in. Uh, this is something that uh, comes straight from having conversations uh, with the American people, as he's had over the past year, leading to this, uh, certainly leading to the process. And so, look, these are these there are massive undertakings, right? Massive undertakings in in having uh, having. Uh, uh, a State of the Union that speaks to where we are as a country and how we're moving forward. And so that's what I'll say. And does he have any State of the Union traditions? Like, is there something he does tomorrow to prepare for a speech like that? So I, I don't have anything to share. He's going to be, I can say that he's going to be working, uh, working on the speech uh, throughout the day, fine-tuning the speech. He'll be doing that with his senior staff. And um, just, you know, it's a major address. It's an important speech. He's going to be uh, delivering it to millions of Americans who are going to be tuning in, and we appreciate that in front of, uh, obviously, Congress and guests of, of Congress, guests of the President, and it's going to be an incredibly important moment, and the President takes that very, very seriously. Go ahead, Karen. Thanks, Corrine. Uh, a federal judge in Texas ruled that uh, the minority business development agency's presumption that black and brown communities are disadvantaged is unconstitutional and enjoin the agency from distributing its services based on race. Um, is the White House concerned that this ruling could undo some of the efforts that, that, you've, been, uh, that you've been making to bolster uh, black businesses? So look, I'm going to refer you to the DOJ for specific uh, questions about this particular ruling. But what I can say that the president is very proud of the bipartisan infrastructure law that made the M MBDA a permanent part of the federal government. He's very proud of that. It's important. Uh, small businesses, as you know, are the backbone of our economy. And, uh, and so it's, it's vital. It's vital for our entrepreneurs to have uh, the opportunity uh, to start a business. We've seen a 16 million applications uh, that was started under this administration over the past three years, which is important. There was a, uh, certainly a, a boost uh, in what we saw with, um, with minority businesses uh, starting their small businesses, obviously, uh, filing those applications, and we think that's really important as it relates to specifics and the way forward or anything like that as it relates to the ruling. I would have to refer you to the Department of Justice. Well, State of the sure. Union. Sure. Um, in 2020, when the president won in his victory speech, he thanked black voters for their outsized role in his history when um, he said that he would have their backs. Um, obviously, uh, polling and anecdotal reporting shows that a significant number of black voters still feel that the president hasn't completely had their backs or have not felt the impacts of this administration's policies. How much of this speech does the president see as an opportunity to lay out what he believes um, he has done to have the backs of black Americans? So look, we understand that um, it's, it's complicated, right, in the sense of what the American people have gone through the last three years. We came in, there was a pandemic, uh, and there was an economy that was in a tailspin. So we get it. We get that Americans, some Americans are trying to still figure out where we are and what's going on and what this administration has done. This is why the State of the Union is going to be so critical, so important, because the president gets to lay that out. It gives the president an opportunity to speak to that. And so that's important. But. To, your, to the beginning of your question about 2020 and the promise that the president has made, he did make a promise. And he has 
done everything that he can to keep that promise. You think about voting rights. Uh, the first couple of days of this administration, he put forward an executive action to do everything that he could on the federal level to deal with uh, f to deal with that issue. So he did that. Uh, he took executive action when Congress could not move on the George Floyd uh, Justice in, po in Policing Act. You know that. You covered that. He took actions from where he could from here, from the federal government. Uh, and so, look, there are other ways that he has uh, taken action, obviously, uh, to make sure that Communities that have felt that they've been that felt left behind are not left behind, and you see that in every, for example, every economic policy that he's moved forward with, whether it's the bipartisan infrastructure legislation, whether it's the Inflation Reduction Act that really deals uh, with making sure that we're that uh, Medicare has the ability to to fight big pharma, right? So that many people in, in the community who've been paying hundreds of dollars for insulin, for example, now seniors are capped by 35 bucks. These things matter. These things add up. These things are important. And so uh, he takes that very seriously. When he walked into the administration, unemployment for the black community, for example, was over 9%. Now it's at 5%. That's because of the work that this administration has taken. Think about the American Rescue, Rescue Plan, the, uh, the uh, child tax credit, really cut child poverty in the community by half. That's because, obviously, the work that this president has done. That piece of legislation, only Democrats voted for it. So the president's taken action. We understand that it's complicated. It's it's going to take some time for everyone uh, to see what we what this president has been able to do. The State of the Union is a perfect opportunity, perfect opportunity to lay that out. Okay, Janie. Okay. Uh, thank right. you, thank you very much. I had a question about the. Uh, China. Uh, the President Biden uh, signed an order of action which prohibits enemies from stealing American personal or government information. And uh, there is a list of six countries, including China and North Korea. My question is, how is the investigation into the Confucius Institute which is acting as China's intelligence agency processing in the United States. Got it. So say that one, so the president signed, say that one more time. Yeah, the president signed the uh, order of uh, action for the enemies, still the enemies, mm -hmm. U.S. Uh, information. But that there's a, a list of six countries, <coughs> including China and mm -hmm. North Korea, or whatever, Iran, mm -hmm. or six countries. Yeah. So how is the investigation of, into the Confucius Institution, which is acting as China's uh, intelligence agency processing in the United States and all of the world? Mm -hmm. And Korea also too. Yeah, that's something as it relates to any investigation. That's something that the Department of Justice could go into. I'm not going to go into it from here. Okay. Thank you. All right, no problem. Go ahead, go ahead, Andrew. Uh, thank you. Uh, when the president speaks tomorrow night, uh, you said he's going to talk about his uh, efforts to uh, to bolster democracy. Uh, is he going to have a message for uh, viewer people viewing this uh, in other countries and in U.S. allies? Because uh, I'm looking at some polling data from the UK. Uh, it says that 48% of British uh, adults see uh, the West response to Putin and Russia getting worse if the president loses re-election. Uh, over half, 52%, say that uh, if the president loses re-election, the West's approach to climate change uh, would worsen. Uh, is he going to try and reassure people around the world that uh, democracy uh, is strong and project strength that he can uh, win the election? So I'm going to be careful because you're asking me this question as it relates to the election and upcoming election is going to be super. No, wait. Every time I say that, everyone gets a little uh, a little upset that I say that. <laughs> but I'm going to try and answer your question. But I just have to be super mindful here. I mean, that's, the, that's just how it works here. Uh, I'm a federal employee. There's something called the Hatch Act. Got to be mindful. <laughs> Um, and so, uh, look, I talked about how the president's going to mention the national security supplemental and how important it is, as certainly because we've seen what's going on in Ukraine, right? And one of the things that we know and we believe, and this is something that I had mentioned that the CIA, CIA director shared with uh, the big four, is that we see that 
Ukraine is losing ground on the bat in the battlefield right now, and we believe it's because of Congress's inaction, right? And so it does matter. It does matter if we take action or not. It does matter that if we get this national security uh, supplemental done or not. It does. Um, other countries look at what we're doing. The president has led the way in bringing NATO together, led the way in bringing other countries, 50, more, 50 countries plus, together on making sure that you, the brave people of Ukraine have what they need, the security assistance that they need to fight against Russia's aggression. So yeah, it does matter. It does matter how, how we move forward. Uh, I'm not going to get specifics into the president's, uh, president's uh, speech. I think that's important. I got to let the president speak to that. You heard me at the top talk about the importance of democracy, talking about unifying uh, the American people. The president thinks that's really important, protecting our fundamental freedoms, and our democracy itself is incredibly important. Uh, so look, and let's not forget here what many Americans have been going through, right? The attacks that they have seen, the threats that they have seen. So there is an important, important message that the president wants to send to the American people about that as well. And so, but to your broader point of your question, does our actions and how we, for example, deal with Ukraine and make sure they have the assistance that they have, the inaction of Congress, does that matter? Yes, it matters. I mean, Putin continues to move forward, right? And we have seen what the, battlef the battlefield has looked like for Ukraine. They have lost ground because Congress has had inaction. So it does matter. It does matter. I'm not going to get into specifics as to what the president's going to say. One more on, on Haiti. Uh, yeah. The Haitian prime minister is in Puerto Rico. Obviously, yesterday, yeah. the vice president's office said that she will be in Puerto Rico uh, later this later this month, uh, any chance that she could be asked to uh, meet with uh, the prime minister and perhaps pass a message? Uh, look, um, you would have to certainly speak to her office uh, about her travel um, uh, and where she's going to be. We've been very clear. We've been very clear dealing with our. Uh, what our message has been, essentially, right? Dealing with, uh, for, the, for some time now, with CARICOM, our Haitian partners, how we see the path forward, and that is restoring democratic order uh, in Haiti through free and fair elections. That's been our message. Inclusive governance and power sharing. That's what we want to see. And we want to give the people in Haiti, we want to make sure that they have an opportunity to democratically elect their prime minister. That's what we want to see. Um, and I will leave it there. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for having us.